Welcome back everybody. Uh, we're going deep down the rabbit hole today. Uh, you guys are requesting it out there, so I'm willing to go as deep as you want me to go. But uh, today, the main uh, meat of the video is literally gonna be walking you through the entire lockup systems on just about any automatic transmission, but mainly this E4OD. And uh, we're gonna go inside this torque converter. I went a little bit evil with this thing and uh, plasma cut it apart. So without understanding how the torque converter works, it's kind of impossible to understand torque converter lockup systems. So we're gonna do that today, learn a torque converter, mainly the torque converter clutch lockup on uh, on off E4OD and PWM pulse width modulated lockup systems. So that, and also I'm gonna show you what, what I found with this pump because might as well go ahead and do that too. So stick around, buckle your seatbelt and grab your Red Bull because it's gonna be an interesting one. First off, a couple things. Uh, one of the reasons it takes me two to three weeks to put out one video is I only have three days a week to shoot these videos because my son Marshall does all the videoing. So give him a shout out. Um, and I refuse to do these videos without somebody filming it because it's a lot harder to understand. And he's been doing an amazing job. So shout out to Marshall on that one. And uh, two reasons I'm doing these videos is through all these years, I'm like, I should be shooting these videos. But one reason is I'm willing to share anything I know about this with anybody willing to listen. And I learned this lesson way back when I, uh, when I first started, I started at a dealership and it was about 20 mechanics and half of them, and I was just a newbie, but half of them were, wouldn't, wouldn't, weren't willing to share their knowledge with me. And it kind of drove me nuts because I was just sponging anything I could. So I vowed to myself early on in my career to uh, never hold back information to anybody that will listen and try to learn anything I know. And I expect the reciprocation and that's kind of served me well over my life. So that's one of the main reasons that I'm willing to go as deep as you guys want me to go. And I probably have a better understanding of transmissions in general of any other system on a car just because I was a builder for 20 years. So like I say, I'm willing to go as deep as you want to go and we're going deep today. So should be interesting. Stick around. That's one reason. Uh, the other reason is, let's see, uh, Rod's Huffy. That's a cool name anyway, by the way. Uh, I don't know if that's your stage name or your real name, but I, I can tell you're already cool. But you asked me to talk about torque converter clutches and all that and the system. So I'm just going to spill it all out. And you should have a really good understanding of not only torque converter clutch on off systems, but pulse width modulated systems also. So that's another reason you requested it. So I'm going to do it. Okay. Another reason I'm doing these videos is, uh, Rod's Huffy was telling me how uh, he paid $5,000 for his E4OD or 4100, I believe, and it only lasted 10,000 miles. And <clears throat> this is where the rubber meets the road, I guess. And there's a lot of bad transmission companies out there. I don't know what happened to your trans. I'm very curious to find out after you tear it down. It seems like you're going to rebuild it yourself, but. Just let me know what, what happened and why it failed after 10,000 miles because the transmission that you get is only as good as the builder at the bench. Just always remember that and you never know what you're gonna get. So uh, that's an, another reason I wanna help people out there because I hate seeing people get ripped off and have these kind of problems where their transmission fails after 10,000 miles. So. For, for all the Rods, Huffies, and, and the Marvin Pastadons, and the Douglas Bales. What's up, Douglas? We're doing it today. But, uh, again, that's just another reason why I'm doing these videos. 
Okay, and, uh, I have a third reason why I'm willing to put these videos out, and it's probably the most important reason, but uh, I got a comment the other day on my solenoid video. His name is, uh, well, it's not his name, it's Zerks. What is it? Zerk says WTF, and you know what that stands for, but he's, he's just, I guess, out of high school, and he's getting ready to go into college or community college or whatever it is to learn how to do automotive. And he left a comment on my channel uh, being thankful that he found this channel because I'm doing videos like this. So Zerk, whatever your real name is, um, I'm more than happy to do these videos for people like you because uh, us gearheads are becoming a dying breed and anytime I can help a younger person and like I said from the beginning of the video I'll never be the person that holds back information so um, I'm glad you found this channel uh, just stick around because a lot of my videos are just gonna be piles of information if you can just soak it up it, it's all good shit and it all pertains to working on vehicles. So welcome to the channel and uh, let's just do this. All right, to start with, I'm gonna talk about this pump and why I had to completely tear it apart. But when I, I did the initial inspection, I didn't catch this. And if you look at this stator really close here, there's a crack right there. And I didn't catch that on my inspection, but I, thank God I caught that when I was getting ready to build the pump for the other video, but <laughs> there's a joke at work. Um, I used to have eagle eye vision when I was younger and I'm getting up there a little bit. So the joke at work is uh, I better grab my two fifties, which I have right here. These are just, I think they're one seventy fives. So I got my two fifties here now, but a lot of times I have to go grab my two fifties just to catch stuff like that. So, Wherever your eyesight is, make sure you got whatever glasses you need to catch little things like that. Cause that was, <clears throat> that could have been a real problem if, uh, if I didn't catch it. But, so we ended up having to get a new pump body and gears for our good use, I should say. But so they ended up sending me a whole pump. So I was like, all right, I just got a, I got a new stator and a new pump body. No worries. But the one that they gave me has a good stator. The stator's fine. And I was just gonna use the, uh, the pump body and the stator, cause that was all pressed in. And I got to looking at this stator here. And there's a huge crack right here where it got tossed. So that is unusable. So that's why I had to press it all apart and use the state, the uh, pump body that came out of the trans originally, the one that Rick changed, and then use the stator that came out of this one with the bad pump body. So uh, went there, figured that out. That's fine. So I went to press this stator into this pump body. No big deal, right? And I pressed this down on here. Went to press that on. And it went all the way down. Basically, that has to go flush. It went all the way down, but it wouldn't go completely flush. It's like, what the hell is going on here? So, I ended up, you know, I could fit a 6,000 feeler gauge between this surface and this surface. So, I ended up having to press it back apart and figured out, if you look at these, they're basically the same stator, but I guess you just they're just different ears. But if you look at the chamfer here, if you look at that chamfer right there real close, <clears throat> and you look at this one, you notice that this one isn't as chamfered as this one. If you look at these stators, you notice that's basically square right there. And this one has a bevel on it. So, in trying to press this into the one that's not chamfered very far, it wouldn't go all the way. It would go to six thousandths, but not flush. 
So, all I'm gonna do is take a Dremel tool and chamfer that a little bit more, no big deal, to where this will press down flush to the surface. No big deal, but that was interesting. You wouldn't think there'd be that little bit of difference makes the difference, but it does. So I kind of take this as challenging instead of trying to get another, another uh, stator and pump body. I just do whatever it takes to get these right because I know I have two good parts here and waiting, waiting on a, a, a different one to come that could be damaged also, you just don't know. But that's the importance of not throwing parts around when you're rebuilding these things because that kind of stuff can happen. And I don't think Rick caused that either. I know I didn't because I learned years ago not to uh, throw parts around for that reason and this reason. So it's just a good lesson to learn. But as far as that goes, we have a good body, a good stator. I'm just going to dremel that a little bit, chamfer it, and that'll press just fine to each other, if that makes sense. So that's what I found with the pump. <clears throat> We got good parts, just got made happen, and the pump will be fine. Okay, another thing to note here is uh, it's not about the pretty paint. Uh, Rick put this pump in and it was I'm sure it was good other than that crack originally, but when it comes to transmissions, it's not about the pretty paint. It's about the functionality of the part and the, how good it is and not damaged. And Rick, I know that just hurt your soul, but if you think about it this way, your, your uh, badass slick paint jobs are only as good as the body work underneath it. So it's a good way to look at transmission parts also. So steer clear. Uh, sometimes the pretty paint is fine, but as long as everything behind that is good, then you're good to go. Okay, to start with, we basically just got to go into inside this torque converter. And uh, yeah, I love a good plasma cutter. I was able to cut this thing apart and... There's really only four main components to a torque converter. Basically, you have your impeller or your pump that all the veins inside this thing are connected to the housing of the converter, which is basically being driven by your engine. Because these two are basically welded together. So that's bolted to your flywheel and your veins are connected to your engine. That's basically your pump of the torque converter. So you have an impeller and you have a turbine. This is called the turbine and that is connected to your input shaft. And you have your lockup clutch, which is in turn, spline to your turbine so just remember that the clutch is splined to the turbine it's part of the turbine basically and then you have your stator so that's basically the four parts your impeller your turbine your stator and your lockup clutch so how this works is, and there's, I'm not really gonna get too involved in how this works. It just, you need to understand how a torque converter works to truly understand how the lockup system works. But what this does here is the being driven by the engine and you got the pump is pumping fluid in. And this is basically the flow of the fluid through a torque converter. So you got your impeller here or your pump and the fluid comes in and it goes in the center here and it gets forced out the outer ring of it. So you see the fluid flow goes around and it hits the turbine veins. It gets forced into the turbine veins. And if you notice these veins here, they're like cupped like that. So that fluid hitting those cups forces this to spin. So in the early days, they were called fluid couplings because they didn't quite have the technology right. Now they're called torque converters and I'm gonna show you why, but 
<clears throat> in the early days, they were very inefficient because these two spin separately. And it's your, your transmission is basically being driven by fluid. There's no mechanical link between your engine and transmission until your torque converter clutch lockup comes on. But for now, let's just keep it like simple. Say there's no clutch in it. These two are spinning free all the time differently. And it pumps the fluid into the turbine, which forces it to spin. And that's connected to your input shaft. <clears throat> now what makes it a torque converter as opposed to just a fluid coupling, if you look at this, this fluid flow, it's going from your pump into your turbine, causing your turbine to move or spin, which in turn is connected to your input shaft. <clears throat> that fluid is being forced through the stator, the stator here. <clears throat> so it's coming around. And if you notice these veins, these veins right here are directing the fluid because the fluid coming out of the turbine is going the wrong way. So to efficiently multiply torque, it has to be redirected into this, these uh, impeller veins. So it makes it a lot more efficient. Now, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I got a comment the other day. This stator here, there's a one-way sprag in this thing. It'll, it locks one way and it spins the other. Okay, moving now, on, this, uh, this stator here. You got the fluid flow being redirected into the pump portion of it properly, which helps multiply the torque because it takes a lot of, of actual torque multiplication to get a, a vehicle moving, a heavy vehicle from a stop because that pump is pumping, but this is moving slow. So this is what multiplies the torque. Now, I got a comment the other day. Um, a guy was telling me that his, his E4OD felt like it was taking off in a higher gear, even in reverse. And I got to thinking the other day, I've only seen this probably a dozen times in, in my whole career of building transmissions, but reverse only has one gear. So if it felt like it was taking off in a higher gear, it's very possible. Now with this stator here, and this is a 700 transmission, but they all work the same way. So just keep in mind, it's the same on an E4OD, but this stator here has a one-way clutch, if you notice that. And when that fluid is being redirected in here and it's trying to multiply torque, if that sprag is bad, this thing will spin when it's supposed to be locked and it's not redirecting the fluid properly. And it's a weird feeling when, when that, that sprag goes bad because literally it, it, the feeling you get is basically if you ever driven a car with a clogged uh, catalytic converter where it just has no power. But when, these, when a sprag goes bad in the stator, it's not redirecting the fluid properly and this thing is spinning. So it basically becomes a fluid coupling, a very inefficient torque converter basically. But the feeling you get when that is bad is it'll be super sluggish to take off. And you think you got a clogged catalytic converter, but it's actually, you feel it go from first gear to second gear to third gear to fourth gear, but it's very sluggish. So that made me think the other day that it's possible that your sprag is bad inside your torque converter. And like I said before, it's the feeling of a clogged catalytic converter. And like I say, I've only seen that about 12 times in my whole career, but <clears throat> that is the symptom you get when that sprag is bad inside your stator. Okay, another very important thing to note here is the fact that 80% of heat in an automatic transmission is made in the torque converter because those two are spinning opposite and it's just churning and burning that fluid trying to get this up and running, basically your wheels, as, as it starts moving and gets up to speed. So again, 80% of the heat is made in a torque converter. And I'm gonna explain it a lot deeper of, of how the system, uh, 
how the cooling system works. But it's a good thing to know that that much heat is made in the torque converter. And that's what kills transmissions. Heat will kill a transmission. Okay, now we established actually how the torque converter itself works. And it's just a fluid coupling. There's no mechanical link until you add a torque converter clutch. And this torque converter clutch, this is the torque converter clutch here. This is spline. Basically, if you look at this close, it's spline to your input shaft, basically. And the these torque converter clutches, it works identical to a manual transmission clutch, and it has dampening springs in it, just like a manual transmission clutch, if you think about it that way. And once the, the converter clutch applies, it literally is just like a manual transmission clutch. But this clutch, this whole clutch assembly is splined to here, which is splined to your turbine, splined to your input shaft. So basically, that goes on there. It's splined to your turbine. And that basically is one piece here. But when the torque converter clutch is off, there's fluid comes through the center. On this one, it's the input shaft. And this is your housing that's bolted to the engine. Now, with the converter clutch off, they're spinning the impeller and the turbine are spinning two different speeds and there's no mechanical link but when this torque converter clutch comes on it pushes the fluid inside the converter itself here pushes this against the housing the actual housing here and it locks your engine to your transmission mechanically it locks not not hydraulically so that's basically what happens when your torque converter clutch comes on. And the way this works is you have two different pressures. You have uh, your apply pressure is what they call it. That's here on this side of your converter clutch. <clears throat> and on this side, you have release pressure. So when it's off, you have release pressure, relief pressure coming through the input shaft pushing it off. And then when it activates the lockup system, it just exhausts the fluid on this side of the clutch. You have pressure on this side, on this side, no pressure on this side, pushing it off that exhaust through the input shaft and your clutch comes on and locks to your engine. So that's basically uh, I guess a layman's way to explain how a torque converter clutch works. Okay, another very important thing to note here, and I'm just trying to throw as much information in these videos as possible, but if you come in close here, and this is where your torque converter bolts, bolts to your flex plate. Now, the bolts you put in here, they absolutely cannot be too long because if they're too long and they hit this cover, what that does is dimple this surface here. So if you were to put too long a bolt, you dimple that surface and it'll basically ruin this torque converter clutch because those three dimples, it can't clamp solid to the, uh, to the actual torque converter housing itself. Um, so anytime, even if they're factory bolts, just make sure they're not close because, because we had, uh, back in the day, the early Toyotas. They came in the shop and we r and would them, with, put the factory bolts back in, but the way they designed those bolts, they were just touching that cover when you uh, from the factory. And then, if you know anything about bolt torque, when you torque a bolt, it stretches the bolt. So, from the factory, it just touched the cover, it was fine. But when you r and the trans and put the bolts back in, they were already stretched and they stretched that much more and they dimpled the cover. And I, I, I can't tell you how many countless ones came back within three to four weeks with that clutch burned out. And that happened across the country. It wasn't just our shop, but the, the fix was to just grind about 50, 60 thousandths off of each bolt. 
and that cured the problem. But there was probably millions of them out there failing for that reason. So if you ever uh, use bolts that aren't factory, you gotta make sure that they're not too long and it doesn't dimple that cover. Very important to note. Okay, just another note. Um, another way I look at building, and I learned this fairly early on in my career, is uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You ever seen that movie, Shooter? Badass movie, but that's the way I approach transmissions because if you try to go too fast building, there's a good chance it won't uh, come together good or you'll miss something. So bottom line is slow is smooth, smooth is fast, and let the transmission tell you how fast you can build it. Like running into all these pump problems and I've spent six hours building a, an entire E4OD and I've spent 15 hours re basically rebuilding the same transmission, but it's all blowed up and you gotta change different parts and you run into this kind of issue, stuff like that. But let the transmission tell you how fast it's gonna go, not the other way around. Okay, now we're gonna get into the meat of the video and how the torque converter clutch, pulse width modulated clutch system works in these transmissions. Because it literally is the cause of many sleepless nights and check engine lights and uh, for many of many of men and builders alike out there. So let's get into it. This diagram here that I drew is pretty much going to be able to explain everything that happens in a torque converter clutch system. And these systems, they, they all work very similarly in every transmission out there. There's, there's definitely differences, but after I explain all of this, you should have a really good understanding of the torque converter clutch lockup system. But, so I went ahead and drew out a layman's drawing here. If you look at this, this is a, a hydraulic diagram. It's basically an electrical diagram on steroids, but we're basically just talking about this one system right here in uh, as far as the torque converter clutch and all these are, drip, are drawn right here. So to simplify it, we're just talking about that, not even worried about that. And everything here is basically drawn out here. Okay, to start with, uh, I guess the first thing to start with here is, uh, if you look at this close here, this is your converter regulator valve, and it goes in your pump about right there. And what this valve does is it, it gets line pressure to it. You've got line pressure coming into it. And coming out of it is your, basically your uh, converter regulator pressure. So it's the pressure that is filling up this torque converter here is regulated. It's not just line pressure. And that's this pressure on this side, this side of the clutch. All that inside the torque converter. If that's not regulated... Basically, it can cause the converter to balloon because balloon, uh, line pressure rises and falls all the time. At idle, it's about 70. The more you hit the gas, it, it can go all the way up to 200 in, in reverse, 150, 170 full throttle, full power. So it has to be regulated. This pressure has to be regulated inside the torque converter, and that's what this valve does, and that's basically in your pump right there. Now, if you see this here, you got, you got your line pressure coming in and it's being regulated. So this whole converter here is being, uh, the pressure is being regulated by that valve. And this shift kit has you putting in, here's your converter regulator valve. It has you putting in, they put in a little bit stronger spring just to up that pressure a little bit which is basically part of shift kits a lot, of, a lot of times. So that's your regulated converter pressure. And also that pressure is feeding the release side. So you have your regulated converter pressure here. And then if you remember the release oil coming through your input shaft, pushing that off is this pressure here. It's basically the same pressure going through and pushing the clutch off. So that's very important to note uh, what that valve does and how that pressure works. Okay, uh, working on the release side now, if you look at this close, 
if you notice the release pressure comes in this and this is a 700 transmission the release oil comes in and comes out the input shaft here now if you notice there's no holes in the input shaft the way ford does it is you have your stator here and it's kind of nice the reason one of the reasons i'm doing this video is because i have this apart and it's a lot easier to explain but if you look in there close there's a feed hole right here this is your release pressure and that release pressure fills that inner cavity in there all the way out and if you notice real close here how this bushing is in there but there's there's grooves behind the bushing so even though there's no hole in the input shaft the way that release pressure comes through there is behind that bushing in this cavity and it's basically doing the same thing as this is but it's just directed that way instead of the input shaft so you basically have your release pressure coming through your stator here or your input shaft, same, same way it works, pushing that clutch off. And that's, that's this drawing right here, your fluid pressure. Now this, this here is your converter clutch regulator valve. Now this is an E4OD here. I'm gonna explain the 40100 after I get done explaining the E4OD, but this is your converter clutch regulator valve goes in right there and what happens here is you get when the converter clutch is off you get basically your regulated your regulated pressure coming through this valve which is right there as you can see it's coming through this part of it and the pressure comes in, goes into the stator, wherever that hole is, right there, and comes out the input, the in, in front of the stator basically, right here, and pushes your clutch off, if that makes sense. So that's torque converter clutch off. Okay, now that we established torque converter clutch off, when, it, when the computer, when it's time to lock up, say 30, 40, whatever mile an hour, and the torque converter clutch, the computer commands it on. If you look at this diagram here, all it is is you got your pressure coming into your TCC solenoid, coming in, and the computer activates it, and it lets fluid through the TCC solenoid to the back side of this valve right here, and forces that valve to move and what it does is say so you got you got fluid pressure coming in pushing the clutch off all it does is move the tcc valve a little bit till it bottoms out and it cuts off the fluid pressure coming in and now that whole cavity is being exhausted so when it's pushing the clutch off there's no fluid getting to the exhaust side. When it, when it goes to lock up and that clutch needs to come on, it just moves. The pressure coming in is no longer. And now that all that pressure in there is able to exhaust. And it's basically, that's this, uh, this orifice right here. And that's, that's basically going back to your sump. So, when it exhausts, you're right here, all the fluid goes, now this is uh, E4OD only, it's just an on-off torque converter clutch lockup. So basically the computer says lockup, moves that valve, and it exhausts that fluid out of that orifice, which basically all that fluid pressure pushing that off gets exhausted right through that Right through that cup plug. Now, this is uh, this is where it gets important in determining how firm you want your lockup to be. Because if you look at this here, right here, lockup firmness, uh, normal seventy six thousandths, firm eighty two thousandths, firmness ninety three, and <clears throat> that orifice there is what is regulating the 
the uh, exhaust of that pressure and how hard that clutch comes on. So in a, in a lighter duty situation, you, you basically don't drill it out too much. But if you got a super heavy duty truck that needs that clutch to come on and real fast because it's got so much load that if it doesn't come on fast enough, it'll slip on and burn. So that orifice right there is what controls the apply of that clutch, if that makes sense. And another thing to note here is anytime you're shift kit and you gotta pay attention, anytime you're drilling out orifices or drilling out plates, bigger is not always better because you don't want things banging or slamming on. All that's doing is hammering parts inside the trans. A nice tight shift or a nice tight lockup apply, but you don't want it banging. And that's the reason bigger is not always better. It's just determining the application of the vehicle that the trans is going in, as opposed to what size you drill holes. Just very important to note. Okay, a v another very important note to make here is, uh, and I almost forgot about it, because I, I usually consider this in the bushing inspection, but if you come in closer on this, on this stator here and your input shaft goes through here and your your lockup whoop your lockup release oil look down here your lockup release oil is coming through the inside of the stator if you remember that back bushing is right here and all that fluid pressure if those bushings are wore out you'll get the release pressure will leak out out the back of this and you'll lose your release pressure, which can cause this clutch to start uh, uh, slipping on when it's not supposed to because you're losing your release pressure. So like I say, I almost missed uh, telling you about that because I consider this in my, in my bushing inspection and replacement, but every bushing is important, especially that back bushing, so you don't lose your torque converter clutch release pressure. But if you look at these bushings, there's another bushing in the front here. These bushings are different. You notice the grooves here. See, there's a, a oiling groove here to help lube the bushing. And that goes all the way through because on this one, your release pressure comes through the back behind the bushing. And it's also able to come through the uh, lube grooves. But this back bushing is right here and it this groove this lube groove here does not go all the way through it it comes in loops around and then comes back in the same cavity in the release side cavity it doesn't go all the way through to where it can leak all the way through that bushing so very important to note but i but I almost missed that because I just consider that in my bushing and replacement inspection and not my torque converter inspection, basically. Just an important note. Okay, now that we've established uh, the lockup in an E4OD, moving on to uh, the 4 100 the pulse width modulated system in uh, E4OD, or uh, 4 100s But the way I look at this, I'm sure you, any hardcore fuckers out there have heard of the pussification of America. Well, the PWM lockup system is basically the pussification of freaking uh, transmissions. But moving on, the way a pulse width modulated lockup works, and it's basically the same system, but you have a, a PWM solenoid, instead of an on off pulse width modulated solenoid. So just stick that in line, same thing. And what happens is when a computer goes to, uh, when a computer goes to lock up the transmission, it pulse widths, it pulses the solenoid. Basically has a certain amount of on time and a certain amount of off time. And it does that I think it's like 10 times a second. So what it does is it pulses the fluid going, going through here at whatever rate it's deciding. And what happens is this valve 
gets oscillated in the bore. Instead of it just moving on off, this thing is being pulsed and it's, it's regulating the pressure and the exhaust by that land right there a little bit at a time. So it's, it's basically, when they came up with this, the clutch it is designed, literally by design, to slip on. Now, in my opinion, it's just terrible because anytime a clutch is slipping inside a trans or a torque converter, it's literally burning itself up. But that's how the pulse width um, modulated 4R100 locks up as opposed to an on-off E4OD. And in my opinion, that's the, that's the worst thing they could have done, but they did it. And a lot of car makers have gone to that. But to, uh, to combat that, we gotta talk about three different clutch materials. And Rods, you were asking me about this. It's super important. So basically your torque converter clutch material, what this is made out of, they, they use three different types of materials. And this is basically a regular clutch. And a lot of times you just have a regular clutch material, paper material that uh, is bonded to this whole plate here. So that's the first style. And a lot of your on off systems just use regular paper. This set, converter actually was a little bit beefed up and this is high energy material. It stands up to heat a little bit better. So on an on off system, either one of these are fine to use. But if you were to put one of these, these two types of materials in a, in a pulse width modulated 4R100, it would burn that, either one of those clutches right out of it. So what they came up with was basically uh, woven carbon fiber is what, what they're, all the PWMs use nowadays. And it's just a, a material that's really uh, resistant to heat. Mm. So <clears throat> the main thing to know is when you're putting a torque converter in a trans, if it's pulse width modulated, it has to have that woven carbon fiber clutch in it because literally it's designed to slip on when, when, it's, when it's being applied by the computer. Now, you can, you can put a woven carbon fiber in a regular on off, that'll work fine. But if you go the other way, it'll burn that clutch out for, for that reason of how it regulates the coming on of that clutch. And I don't, I don't understand for the life of me, it's all for comfort, it's all horse shit, but that's the reason they do that, just so it's, you don't really feel it coming on. I like to feel my shifts, even my lockup. I just don't want it banging. So that's the three different types of converter clutch material that they use. And that's pretty much across the board in every transmission. Okay, another note on uh, fluids that, that are used in transmissions and that last E4, E4OD I did in that F250, I literally just put Dextron 6, which is GM transmission fluid in, and it works fine. But when you get into pulse width modulated systems, uh, you definitely have to use the right fluid. It's uh, recommended for all 4100s to use Mercon 5, and it's because it has friction modifiers, modifiers in it to work with that actual slipping of the, the uh, torque converter clutch. So uh, a guy was asking me the other day about different fluids and stuff. And that's, that's basically the way I've looked at it. And again, if you have an on off system, it's not as important what fluid you use, but when you do have a pulse width modulated clutch torque converter clutch system in your trans, it's important to use the proper fluid. Okay. Um, again, on the pulse width modulated solenoid system, the reason that the, there's so many problems with it is that oscillating and it wears the bores out. And this is a little boost valve that on a 4R100 pulse width system is also in there. Instead of it just being the valve in the spring, you got the boost valve in there. And these boost valves wear out big time uh, as far as because of that oscillating. So... <clears throat> there's two different things you can do. You can make sure you always replace 
the uh, replace that valve in any 4 or 100 that you do. You can just buy that little valve and sleeve because any wear in it, and they all have wear, will cause uh, the basically the check engine light to come on and the torque converter clutch to not work right. But this is, uh, this is something that Transgo sells. They sell a valve system that replaces the uh, PWM style with a different valve system and it converts your 4 100 pulse width modulated to an on off torque converter clutch. And I highly recommend doing that if you ever uh, have a towing situation. I think uh, uh, one of you guys are, are looking to uh, use your E4D 4 100 for towing. I think it is a 4 100. And I would recommend putting this valve system in there to convert your 4 100 to an on off lockup system. And it's, it's basically a simple drop in, no big deal. But just a note on that. Okay, another note, just a quick story about how I learned about this. Uh, if you look close, the converter regulator pressure and the pressure that's regulated inside this torque converter. Um, I had a job way back in the day. It was a 4T80 uh, front wheel drive Cadillac transmission and them things are tanks. I mean, the differential, and it's a front wheel drive transmission and the differential is literally the size of a Ford F250. But uh, I learned this lesson the hard way. We had one come in the shop and rebuilt it and it came in with a torque converter clutch slip code and rebuilt it. Didn't really find a whole lot wrong. Put it back in the car and every, I don't know, 15 minutes of driving or so, it would throw a torque converter clutch slip code. So uh, no matter what I did to try to get this exhaust fluid, I worked on the, the exhaust side of the circuit big time, trying to find what the problem was uh, to try to get this torque converter to not throw this code. And I just went to the hydraulic diagrams for a 4T80 and I ended up figuring out <clears throat> I basically just put a little stronger spring. This is what ended up fixing it was just putting a little stronger spring in the converter regulator side, this side, the pressure side that pushes the clutch on. And that ended up fixing the problem. But it took me like three tries of that trans out and in. And it was a freaking nightmare, pull your hair out. But I did learn from it. So that was one good thing that came out of it. But back in the day, we used to have a, like a baker's scale and we'd have it in the shop and trying to modify uh, valve bodies in any transmission, we would take that baker's scale and push the, push the spring down on the baker's scale and figure out what pound the spring was. And a lot of times we'd just find a different spring that was just a, a few pounds heavier or a few pounds lighter. And we fixed a lot of transmission problems like that because back in the day, they didn't have all the shift kits they have now, all the solutions they have now. There was no Sonics. A lot of this was just on the job training, trying to figure this shit out. So just a cool story about uh, the shit that I've been through to fix transmission problems and torque converter clutch problems themselves. Ready? Okay, uh, another quick note. Um, that last E4, E4OD I did, the last series, the last transmission I showed in them other videos, it was my buddy Rich's truck. And Rich, you commented on maybe explaining how I found the problem with your truck. And to be honest with you, I never did find the exact cause because the problem with the truck, the reason he brought it to me was the overdrive light was flashing and it was throwing a, oddly enough, a torque converter clutch slip code. But I didn't exactly find the problem of why it was throwing that code because it would throw the code. I don't know how often it was. Maybe once every three weeks, it would just throw that torque converter clutch slip code, but went into it and didn't really find the exact cause, but not being able to see inside the torque converter, it could have been possible that they, that, that clutch was starting to wear out, or it could have been possible that the torque converter clutch solenoid was starting to stick sometimes. 
which we put a new solenoid pack in it. We put a new torque converter, which by the way, you always have to put a new torque converter in when you're rebuilding a transmission because you can't see that clutch and you have no idea what condition that clutch is in. So for that reason, they used to reuse them back in the old days, but since they have clutches in them now, literally just like the transmission, if you don't change the torque converter, then you're not changing the clutch. And I would never reuse clutches in a, in a rebuild. And the way I look at it, it's literally like taking a diaper off a baby and wiping the shit out of it and putting the diaper back on the baby. That's the way I look at it if you try to reuse a torque converter. So never reuse a torque converter for that reason. Um, but I replaced the solenoid pack. We replaced the converter. And I went through all the circuitry and the bushings and made sure everything was right and tight. And that's how I fixed your truck as far as that goes. Okay, another very important note, and it's just something cool to think about, but uh, I'm trying to throw as much into these videos as I can as far as information goes. But if you think about it, when this thing goes, when it's in, not in lockup, like I said before, 80% of the heat is made in a torque converter. But when this thing locks up and this is all one, those things aren't churning and burning the fluid. They're locked together. So when it's in lockup, that torque converter is not making any, any more heat because it's not churning and burning that fluid. So it's very important to have the uh, torque converter clutch system working properly, obviously for, for the reasons I've been explaining. But it's just cool to know that when it's in lockup, it's not making any heat and there's that much less chance of your fluid overheating or the more it's in lockup, the less you have to service it, say 40, 50,000 miles. So depending on your driving, if it spends most of its time in lockup, it's, uh, it's not uh, wearing the fluid out as fast, basically. All right, guys, I'll tell you what. After all that, and I know it was a lot, um, I'm going to go ahead and end this video now because I realize it's a lot of information. It was a lot of information for me because I haven't gone that deep into the thought theory of all these systems in, in a long time because once you have them in your foundation, you kind of just rebuild the trans and it is what it is. But I enjoyed this video. That was cool. And it, it kind of keeps me on my toes too, because I had to review stuff and make sure I had my shit right and tight to present it properly. I hope I presented it properly. And uh, if, if you watch the video and you didn't get something, watch it again. And then if you watched it a second time and you didn't get, like literally understand the information, then let me know. These comments is what's driving the video, believe me. The videos I should say so make sure you throw comments in on something you didn't understand or a different way I could have presented it maybe but either way I did my best here and I think at this point you should have a really good understanding of the torque converter lockup clutch systems in an, an E4OD and the example here was a 700 but it basically works the same way and uh, there's no reason to make it complicated as far as that goes. Most transmissions work this way, the way I explained it today. There's a lot of variances, but the basic principle is exactly the way I explained it today. So, uh, uh, been a very cool video. Thank you guys for watching. I know it was a lot. And uh, after your nap, and if you have to watch it a second time, throw your comments out. Very happy to hear them. It's nice talking to all you guys out there and seeing what problems you're having and the fact that you guys are willing to go here and you've never been a builder before, but you're literally thinking of attempting to rebuild your own trans and this is giving you confidence to do it. I love it. I love it. It's the best thing. It's the best feeling for me to see that happening, but I want you to have success because when you don't have success, you're pulling your hair out. So that's the reason I'm doing these videos also. So uh, happy building and 
like and subscribe if you like what you see. And uh, that's going to be it for this. What I left out, I'm going to mention in the next video because it's going to be the, the pump build. And we're going to we're going to make fire. We're going to make the fire again. And then uh, that hopefully will be about a half hour video. And I'm deciding, I don't know, I'm kind of rolling with my feeling at this point because whether I want to do the valve body stuff or actually build the case. Because at this point, I kind of want to see the, the guts in the case and the whole, basically the whole trans build. That way I feel the progress because sometimes you just got to feel the progress to get over that last leg. So we'll see how it goes, but that's going to end this video. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up now. Uh, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you, dude. And uh, I hope this video gets to you. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. It's been a cool one.